And so we sense the spiritual battle going on behind the scenes for the soul not only of Louis XV, but also that of the nation. We might, for example, be able to see the hand of God at work in the events of 1744, at which time the king fell grievously ill. Many thought he might die. In fact, the bishop, to his credit, refused to administer holy unction, unless the king first agreed to get rid of his then mistress, the Madame de Chateauroux, which, to his credit, Louis duly did. To everyone's great surprise, Louis recovered, and lived another thirty years after that. To nobody's great surprise, however, Louis was soon back with his mistresses again, having broken his vow to the bishop. Not only this, but he added to his sins, even ejecting the bishop from the royal court. We might also be able to perceive the spiritual battle as reflected in the diary accounts of the Marquis d'Argenson. The Marquis reflects not only on the king having taken several sisters of the same family as mistresses, but also of the fervent prayers of the faithful for his repentance. The Marquis's diary entry of March the 27th reflects, quote, Devout persons and those who believe in providence reflect that the king, having had all three sisters as mistresses, they have all perished young. The two others died in horrible suffering, and both much younger. People also reflect that God has taken such care of the king's conversion that this death happens at the time of the jubilee to touch his feelings, after his majesty has been prepared by sermons and disposed to make his jubilee sit sincerely. The Jesuits are saying five masses a day in their three houses in Paris, fifteen masses for the conversion of the king, and they burst of it. So Louis, a king weak in mental strength and weak in morals, this could only bode ill for France, which it did. Because of such clumsy thinking, France entered the Seven Years' War, which saw France suffer great loss. It also began a downward spiral in France's economy, from which the nation never recovered, and which ultimately led to the French Revolution. As the old maxim goes, any great empire falls not from without, but from within. If an empire falls militarily and politically, it is because a fall has taken place on the inside prior to that that weakens the fabric and leads to the external political fall. If a leader or people decline into an age of debauchery and section wantonness, it has the effect of weakening the mind, the resolve. Rome fell morally before she fell militarily to the barbarians in the 5th century. When did Babylon fall? On the night of depravity and partying during the famous instance of the writing of the wall. As Isaiah tells us, woe to those who are heroes in drinking wine. Moral collapse precedes actual collapse. Apply these principles to the current West, who goes to any nightclub on a Friday or Saturday night, and you might see some alarming parallels with history past. Louis XV died in 1774. It is said that his last words were, Après moi, le déluge, after me, the deluge. In other words, that he foresaw the chaos of the revolution. Whether or not the story is true, there certainly was revolution only fifteen years after he died, stemming to a great degree from his weakened economic policies. Louis XVI took over from him, but was unable to stem the tide of economic disaster. The people revolted in 1789, causing the French Revolution, which saw the end of the monarchy and a wave of anti-clerical sentiment. The godless philosophes of the Enlightenment saw their opportunity and set up a humanist system persecuting the Church. And so, due to its own decadence and failing, the lampstand of the Church in France was removed from its place, at least for a time, and only reinstated much later. France was then plunged into darkness and the chaos of the Revolution and the reign of terror that soon followed. But it didn't end there. You see, Satan will always look to a powerful country in which to raise up his godless religions or philosophies. Then if that country embraces that ideology, Satan will try to use their powerful military might to take that new ideology, that demonic new idea, to new borders. Many of the ideals of the Enlightenment have come down through the years and provide much of the platform on which we stand today. Now some of those ideas are good and some are bad but the bad ones form part of the humanism that stood opposed to the Church in the 19th and 20th centuries, and also today. The Enlightenment provided a boost to atheism, which received new life as a result. 
It is those Enlightenment principles, that ideology, that formed a convenient alternative to the Christian religion that had served France for so long. In fact, one might almost call these Enlightenment philosophies and ideologies a substitute religion. Now that's a very important concept, and one that's going to come up time and again in this talk. What exactly does that mean, a substitute religion? The book of Ecclesiastes tells us that God has set eternity in men's hearts, or, as has, been, as has been commonly said, in every heart is a God-shaped space. Every human being on planet Earth is wired to seek God, to be reunited with his or her Maker. Now, human beings will do that in various ways. If they don't find the true religion, they will seek out a false one just to fill the void. Even if they don't actually find God, they will go through the motions to satisfy the unconscious impulse that they've found God. If they consciously don't want to believe in God, their religious impulse is so strong that they will cling to a philosophy that gives them purpose in life and makes them feel fulfilled. That is, the unconscious mind will seek out something that has a similar effect to a religion that gives one a sense of fulfillment and destiny, even if that philosophy or ideology doesn't actually call itself a religion. Such is the power of the religious drive in the human being. That means that all human beings on earth have a religion whether they choose to believe it or not. They all have something they have chosen, whether consciously or unconsciously, that purports to give them fulfillment and purpose in life. And this is what makes the new ideology, the new philosophy I spoke of earlier, so dangerous. You see, when the church fails, when the church gets so morally weak that it loses respectability, then the common people reject it and cleave to that new idea that is put forward. Anything to fill the void of the true religion, the new religion that the true religion has left. That new idea effectively becomes a religion to them. This means that, on the level of the unconscious mind, when the leaders of the new ideology persecute the church, it is really a case of one false religion persecuting and oppressing the true religion. As we will see in all three examples from history, the respective new ideologies that rise up in each period are vile things, ideologies that tear apart the people at their core, give them false hope and create misery and woe for millions. On a spiritual level, this means that when the church sins and their light of witness grows dim, this gives a foothold to Satan to come and grow in power and introduce a false, godless, substitute religion and so lead the people of the day into darkness and chaos. But such is the terrible price to be paid when the church dwindles in power and moral fibre and satanic religious ideas are allowed to rise up. The church, persecuted as a result, is the first to pay the price. But the world that has embraced the new ideology soon follows and soon discovers that they have bought into an oppressive system that has enslaved them. So how then do we identify the 18th century ideology of the philosophes as a substitute religion? In fact, sociologists have dissected the psychological motivation of the philosophers of old, the humanists of this period, and have identified certain telltale clues that give away the fact that, on an unconscious level, what the philosophers have done was simply exchange one religion for another. In their earthly wisdom, these philosophers thought they had rejected religion and replaced it with a dry humanistic philosophy that had no religious character. But what they had actually done is reject one religion and replace it with something that had all the traits of religion but a name. Leading historian Michael Burley, in his brilliant book Earthly Powers, brings this out. The philosophes, the intellectuals, may not have been aware of the religious impulse that drove them or the signs that gave them away, but psychological analysis has identified certain things they said and did that gives away the real dynamic that was going on in the unconscious minds. That, in fact, although they might call themselves atheists, agnostics, or deists, their new ideology or philosophy was really little more than a religion to them. For example, one thing the revolutionary philosophers did in their zeal to supplant Christianity was to have Notre Dame Cathedral dedicated to something called, quote, the cult of the goddess of reason, and later the cult of the supreme being. When the Jacobins, heralds of the revolution, first set up, set up shop in Paris, they did so in none other than a Dominican monastery. These same philosophers subsequently went from village to village in rural France, urging and coercing the peasants to reject Christianity 
and embrace their own humanist system, with a zeal reminiscent of the Crusades or Christian mission. And so, for many sociologists, these telltale signs reveal what is really going on on an unconscious and even a spiritual level. That unconsciously speaking, although the Jacobins, the adherents of the new Enlightenment philosophy, had rejected the true religion, they had merely adopted another one in its place to compensate. The zeal with which they tried to spread their newfound faith, what might be called the faith of the faithless, was similar to the zeal with which the French armies under Napoleon, only a few years later, would attempt to spread those same new dogmas to the ends of the earth, except that this new false gospel of so-called equality and peace on earth would be established in the blood and misery of millions of people. The long and the short of this is that, with the principles of enlightenment ideology, Satan knew he had a winner. He knew that this was no fly-by-night idea, here one day and gone the next. He knew that here was a powerful deception he could use to deceive millions and draw them away from the church. Many of these principles he has been using for centuries since then. He also knew that, in working through a nation as powerful as France, he could attempt to use this ideology as a cover and means to gain control over the whole world. He thus raised up a brilliant military commander, the young Napoleon Bonaparte, as a means to achieve this. No sooner was the revolution and reign of terror over than Napoleon and the French army, fired by a misplaced zeal to spread the principles of the revolution to the ends of the earth, caused needless misery and bloodshed, invading country after country, wreaking chaos and mayhem, in the thought that they were doing the human race a favour. The French rejected their king, the hapless Louis XVI, thinking they were getting democracy in its place, but in the end, ironically, they were left with an emperor, as Napoleon proclaimed himself in 1804. The French people were promised freedom and prosperity, but instead attained want and degradation after the revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. This is what Satan does. He promises that if you leave the true religion, you will have peace and freedom, but at the end of the day what he really gives is bondage and oppression. Satan's religious system promises one thing, but only stabs in the back. And all because the church falls to sin and moral decay. We see this pattern repeating itself at least twice subsequent to this. My personal feeling is that Napoleon was the instrument God would have used to punish the entire West if the people of England and the USA had not heeded the awakenings and the Wesley revival. In the case of France, my feeling is that the revolution might have been judgment partially for the St. Bartholomew Day massacre, which had occurred almost exactly 200 years before, and then also, of course, more recently for the moral collapse that occurred during the 18th century. What does this mean as far as the Church is concerned? Let's look at it now on a spiritual level. The Church represented the light of God in France. Picture, if you will, that light or lamp set on a lampstand. Jesus said that the Church is the light of the world, Matthew 5. That is, Jesus is the light of the world, shining and manifesting through the Church. If this is the only light, then of course there is no other, and if the church light goes out, it means there is no other light to turn to, and the world itself goes into darkness. And here is the huge responsibility on the shoulders of the church. We are the moral guardians of the world. We are the light of the world. If our light starts to grow dim, or goes out altogether, it affects the world. The world will suffer. What happens when the light goes dull? The world enters an era of spiritual darkness. It enters an era of oppression and chaos, of godlessness. And so the Church of God, the lampstand mentioned in Revelation 2.5, is slowly, surely, dislodged, removed from its place and taken down. When the Church sins, it gives opportunity to the devil to gain a foothold where he couldn't do so before. When the kingdom of God on earth grows weak, so Satan's kingdom is allowed to grow in strength. If the light goes out altogether, then Satan may well receive permission to take power, setting up godless and oppressive systems on earth, or indeed the country in question. The world may hate us, but we are the only thing standing between it and moral chaos and anarchy. This is why it is crucial that we live pure and moral lives in the eyes of the world and before God. When the church sins, its power base weakens, and it runs the risk of giving rise to an onslaught of Satan's kingdom, an assault which God may well allow in order to chasten and discipline his people. 
It is this precise phenomenon that we see taking place in France in the 18th century. The question we have to ask ourselves is, just how bad was or is the sin of the people, of God, or the Church? Sometimes the Church repents, at other times their wickedness is so bad that they refuse to, and so judgment falls and its lampstand is taken from its place. Still at other times the people of God are too blind to see the real danger, and they are too busy preaching messages of false peace, and refuse to accept that there is a danger. But let's leave France now and take a look at our second example from history, where we once again see the spiritual forces in the heavenlies struggling for the control of the soul of a nation. Let's look at Russia. <laughs> 